Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, you can introduce us uh, from the chat. You can introduce us in the chat. Good morning from Brussels, Rome, uh, a few places around Israel and Lisbon. Uh, it's good for, uh, we're happy to have you here with us. It's kind of a webinar setting, so which means that unfortunately we cannot see your faces, even though we really want to. Um, but please, throughout uh, the webinar, feel free um, to have your comments in the chat. Uh, who are you? Where are you from? And also, as you have questions, feel free to just write them down in the text. And at the end, we will uh, I will moderate them into the questions to our speakers. Um, but as we want to start, I want to invite Farid Sofia um, from Rome, and he's also the co-chair of the employment uh, forum in the ESPD. And uh, so, Fabrice, please. Thank you very much, Ophir. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning from Rome, as it was already said. So just a little introduction before we start, and we go into the core of the uh, of the webinar of today. Um, I will read a few sentences uh, about it. About, let's say that the first thing we have to say, it's about Article 27, as we always speak about uh, work for persons with disabilities, um, about uh, uh, work for persons uh, with disabilities of the United Nations Convention. Um, we all know about it, but, uh, in concrete, the percentage of persons with disabilities in, employed in the open market are, is still very low. Furthermore, persons with disabilities are uh, given an, an, an attractive employment quotas with little career and personal satisfaction. Therefore, the creation of cooperatives and shelter workshops uh, sometimes are the only job opportunities for our clients. Persons with disabilities have also to cope with some personal problems, such as difficulty in concentrating, performance-related anxiety, low self-esteem, and finally, um, strong insecurity. With regards to the set of relational difficulties, feelings of self-centeredness, the need to feel accepted, difficulties in managing competitions and difficulties in understanding relation roles and context were particularly highlighted. Um, I have carried out a short but reliable uh, research. And I saw that the data showed different results with a wide merge, margin of judgment. According to some of the data collected, the majority of the participants considered the quality of life to be good and very good or nor good or uh, bad. On the other hand, I looked on another part of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, research and I saw that the quota of persons not satisfied were quite, quite, quite big. Uh, so there are problems on both what we can decide, but still, you can have very pers persons very well satisfied or persons not satisfied. Moreover, we can have also violence and discrimination in the workplace of persons with disabilities. In, in 2017, 4% uh, percent of persons with uh, disabilities um, were, have been victims of discrimination. This is just to give you a little idea what I wanted to point out is that uh, the large and diverse amount of data collected evidences uncommon judgments, comments, and sensitivities. On the other hand, they are acceptable data as they are uh, high, um, highly uh, subjective, but also placed in the similar context. But it's good to confront the uh, several data research. Which is the lesson learned? that we all agree that it's a concrete right for persons with disabilities to find and enjoy employment. However, we should not engage in a competition to see who can place the most at work. Therefore, it is essential to find a decent work, job accommodating, and as far as possible, suitable for the person to whom uh, such employment 
is being proposed. Finally, evaluate it over time and check the ongoing benefits associated with it. This is just a few lines I wanted to express to all of you, considering the work that uh, uh, our colleague from Israel, uh, they are doing. Um, so uh, this is, again, just to point out a kind of work, how it can be done, and what it means to employ persons with disabilities. That's what I just wanted to say as an introduction. So I give back the floor to Ophir and I thank you for your attention and for being with us. Thank you very much. Ophir, thank the floor for, is your back again. Thank you Fabrizio for your word. Um, it's hard without seeing all of you, but I hope you're having fun wherever you are. Um, so my name is Ophir Peleg. I am actually a lawyer by profession uh, in Shekulotov in the last uh, six years. Um, now I'm the Chief Global Officer and I'm in charge of, uh, of scaling our work internationally and on creating international partnership. So in this, uh, in the upcoming uh, 55 minutes, 50 minutes until we open to questions, um, uh, I will start a bit with a few minutes just uh, presenting you Shekulotov and what we do. Then Hagar will present the uh, managerial decision of uh, measurement. Why do we measure? What, do we need? what, what kind of in, uh, inputs do we have um, out of it? Uh, afterwards, Yael will present uh, the pre-service measurement that we are doing and what do we learn out of that in designing our service differently. Hagal will present the ongoing during service or during training measurement, which is the meaningful, uh, meaningful work practice and vocational practice that we have developed. And then Tal will present the post-placement index. What, how do we measure the work that the service users whom we train uh, do in the open labor market? So um, very generally about us in Shekulotov, we are a non-for-profit Israeli service providers. We are a group of eight different vocational um, enterprises. Uh, we have 7,900 service users in two divisions. We have a social inclusion division where we have more than 12,000 events every year. And we have another 4,500 service users in our employment um, training. Um, it is, if you can say it's still being regulated as shared employment, but we do it a bit differently. Uh, we have uh, 148 units spread all over Israel, and these training units look and feel just like a normal business, but it is a training unit in the community. We have um, a second-hand bookshop chain, we have a fashion chain, you will see it in the video in a second. 36% of the people whom we serve, people who come to us for traditional sheltered employment services, find the job in the open labor market in a regular employee-employer relationships. We have uh, almost 600 employees right now, around 32 million euros uh, annual budget. 75% um, of our income comes from selling vocational rehabilitation services to the government and 25% come from sales of our product. Uh, even though we are non-for-profit, we work on zero donation, zero volunteering policy. Uh, this is something that we do from, we started almost 20 years ago. In the basic of our philosophy is that to bring the service users a respectful vocational journey that starts by choice, but we focus on encouraging them, giving them the tools to think about open labor market. That's where, why when they come to us, we always say, it's good that you came. Now let's discuss when are you leaving? And um, we started our work. Uh, that's, that's what uh, the video I'm going to show you is focused on by people with complex psychosocial disabilities. Today, we also work with people with intellectual disabilities, autism, uh, prisoners, and other people with uh, vocational barriers. So just a very short clip before I hand it over to Hagar.
Okay, thank you for that. And now we we'll present uh, our Agar, uh, chief, our chief vocational officer. Um, Agar has managed uh, all the group vocational engagement ca capacities and services, including our team, uh, our teams, government relations, and R and D uh, for the recovery and rehabilitation aspect of the award-winning integrative unit and the same orders. She has led the development and supervised the implementation across the group, 148 units. Um, Hagar is licensed by the Israeli Recovery and Rehabilitation School in self-advocacy, CFW intervention, and clinical supervision, and is part of the school staff. She holds a BA and MA in occupational therapy from the Tel Aviv University. Hagar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ophir. So, all true. What I want to talk about in the next few minutes is why we measure. And we all measure all the time. I'm sure you measure your data. So I want to be more specific why focus on measuring our data and how to measure. So why has a few aspects. Uh, first of all, for us as management, I think focusing and specializing in measuring really allows us to be more objective and get more uh, reliable uh, information as in regard of what we're doing. We are, um, we have, Chocolatov Group has currently over 100, 148 units all over Israel. Uh, but even if we just had three or four sites, we still need the ability to objectively know what is going on and are we really achieving what we want to achieve. Uh, the second aspect is our teams. Uh, I think a lot of our teams want to know, are we really doing good work? How do you, what do you think about our work? And measuring allows us to identify the success and celebrate it with our team. Um, most importantly, the service users themselves need to be involved in the decision-making and, and the service design. And throughout the measurement system, uh, that allows them to really be involved and um, be taken into account and give their ideas, their thoughts, and their aspiration in how we um, operate the service. And finally, stakeholders, I'm sure you all have them, um, talking about the regulation, the funders, um, for us, it's mostly the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Social Affairs in Israel. Uh, and being able to show real information, reliable information about what we do and the quality of what we do, not just the regular measurements that we need to show, uh, really helps us to um, make them more engaged in our activity and increases the, the chances that they will want to cooperate with us, with us in our next projects. I think, yes, I think that uh, before uh, we created and adopted our uh, impact measurement, we used to measure, but it was harder to understand the big picture. I think we only knew what we know and we were very um, driven to all the, like what is going on right now instead of what is going on in overall. Uh, you, hope, you all know it, you are, um, engage in the drama of what's happening in, a, in one, this or that success or failure, and you forget to look at the big picture and you don't know what you don't know. Um, so effective measurement really allows us to see the full picture and it reminds us about what our focus really is. If there's one thing um, I want you to remember from the, today's webinar is how crucial it is to plan that process of measurement, not just like operate it uh, as we go along. The most important partner is the people that actually do the work, our staff members. So we started from there. And I think you all know that in many cases, staff members, we have the best staff members and they all come from the social world, just like me. And they usually uh, have a lot of objections for measurement. Uh, it's too business-like, you were too focused on the, on the data and not about the people, um, questions that I thought myself um, about as a professional. Um, 
and I think the the main uh, thing to do when you you try to uh, implement this um, measurement uh, uh, impact is to help the staff understand that we are not focusing on just the results. We want to measure the way, the actual work. We want to measure the heart. So we found a solution that helped uh, staff see that. Because I think the, the common mistake about measuring is to think that we are um, measuring the, the how or the what. And that is not what we do. We actually want to measure the why. Our why is to help people with disabilities complete their journeys and to become independent in their uh, um, vocational journey of engagement and find satisfying and good jobs in the open labor market. Um, so if I resemble it to the like medical world, we don't want to measure like this, just the symptoms. We want to really uh, identify and measure the background reasons for what we're doing and are we succeeding or not succeeding. Uh, to give you an example of uh, the personal plans that we do. So we knew before we started, we knew like that each person is uh, getting, has a plan and uh, is reviewed every three months because that's what we decided. But what we didn't know, and that's what we wanted to measure is what is the quality of that personal plan? Um, how is it being done? Is it dynamic enough? Does the service, uh, service user know the plan? That says it, that are they connected to it? Are they leading it? So this is this is the kind of stuff that we started seeing once we started measuring our uh, our data. I think we overall moved uh, in in measuring that from "Are you happy?" to "What do you need?" Because I think before that we only measured the the satisfaction level. Is the person satisfied from the service? Are you happy, so to speak? And in our uh, new measurement system, we are checking what the person needs in order for us to uh, design a better service and uh, for them, for the service user to really be included in planning and designing that service. We have over 246 uh, service users that are service improvers and they are a part of everything we do in Shakulotov. They come from the units and they volunteer to be involved because they care and they want to see the service get better. And they received a, um, a training, a, a special training to uh, um, better uh, like um, self-advocacy and uh, communicate clearly to all their staff members. Um, and they, participate in strategic decision and professional staff HR recruitment screening. Um, and they also took part of this uh, designing the and defining our KPIs or measurements of success uh, and the questionnaire we use, uh, collecting the, the data. And they have their own system of collecting the data that they produce uh, so that it is separate from the staff. The service improvers go to their units and help the other service users to uh, fill the questionnaires that we'll, we'll show you. And, and they send it and uh, deliver it separately so uh, that we can have a more uh, objective and unbiased answer. We feel, we feel so strongly about um, the importance of measurement that we actually created a whole department, an R&D department um, to, to create the impact of the measurement. And it's being led by our fabulous Dr. Beinstein, Dr. Yael Beinstein, who will be presenting now. Just so you know a little bit about Yael before she starts speaking, that Dr. Beinstein, he, she is also a lecturer in a very prestigious university or college in Israel. And she is, specializes in, wait, I have it written, advanced statistical uh, analysis and mythological classes, which I can't hardly even say. 
Uh, and she's also since 2020 is a reviewer for the International Journal of uh, Mental Health, holds a BA in Communication and Human Resources, MA in Social Research, and a PhD in Community Mental Health at Haifa University. Wow. Dr. Einstein. Yeah, it will be hard to uh, move after uh, these words. So hello, everyone. And uh, yes, I am the head of the R&D uh, department in Chikulatov. And as Agar said, we, we see in very high importance the, uh, the evaluation of our services, of our professional models. Uh, Ophir, can you move the slide? Um, so the goals, of, the, goal, the aim and the goal, the main goal of the uh, evaluation processes we conduct in Shkulatov in the R&D department is, as, a, as Agar said, to evaluate the effectivity, the quality of our services, and to understand the before and after. The before and after is just as a complementary um, note to what Agar said, is the ability to see the bigger picture. It's not just understanding what happens after service users come to our units. Uh, it's just understanding the, their background. Why, why do they choose to come for us? The, there is the, the word why is very <laughs> emphasized in this section. Why do they choose to come? What is their former and previous experiences in sheltered employment, in the open labor market? And what happens after they start receiving services in our uh, vocational uh, enterprises? And we do so using different uh, um, data collecting methods. And these methods include digital questionnaires, focus groups, observations, in-depth interviews. In a lot of our evaluation processes, you will be able to see a combination of these methods. And this is in order to enrich the data we receive and to see the bigger picture, not segments of it. And the failure can move on. And we, would, we wanted to bring you an example of a very a massive evaluation process we conducted in the, the department this year. Uh, we conducted an evaluation process this year in Dandasha. Dandasha was established in 2014, and it's a second-hand clothing stores chain in Israel. It includes seven uh, uh, vocational enterprises in Israel, and it includes most of the service users in Dandasha are women. Some of them have been sexually abused. And the training, uh, the vocational uh, enterprises, the units, their self, uh, they act as a very safe place for the service user where service users can actually receive practical training. So in styling, in marketing, in digital, um, uh, 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 in digital platforms, in customer service and so on. And so far, then the Shah has trained hundreds of uh, people with dis persons with disabilities, uh, service users, and has placed more than a hundred of them in the open labor market. And when we started this evaluation process, as I said, we wanted to understand the reasons why do they choose to come to the Shah? What are their expectations from their service, from the service, from the ongoing journey they will go through in the unit? And we wanted to better understand also the characteristics, the, the success, the definition of success in their vocational engagement journey. It's not a, 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 an objective measurement, it's it's objective measurement for each service user. And we wanted to better understand the reasons and what made them come to us actually. So in the end of this process, we received a very detailed uh, report and it's also, um, we received a lot of findings and I won't uh, show you all of them. And now I will show you just a few of them that will express how uh, if a simple measurement can really make you see things different and understand the bigger picture and not just segments of it. So one of the main findings we, we saw that most of the service users in uh, Dandasha had previous experience in the open labor market, 81% of them had worked in the open labor market before they came to Dandasha. And most of them also did not have any uh, former uh, experience in sheltered employment, which means that they came to Dandasha. It was their first encounter with sheltered employment. And they came to us after having probably dealing with a very massive and significant crisis in their lives. So this is a, a characteristics we need to understand and need to know 
in order to better adjust our work and our working models, our professional teams that support them and what kind of support do they need. Okay. Another main finding, which was really interesting because when we started the Ndesha, our main impression was that most of the service users come to the Ndesha because it is only women. And most of the service users in, in the Ndesha are women. And we thought that the mostly women environment is a very uh, imperative uh, element of the service. And this is why they chose to come to the Ndesha. Some of the, these service users are uh, for, have been dealing with sexual abuse. So we thought, and it was very, very normal uh, expectation that most of them will choose them the share because there will be only women there. And what we were really surprised to know after a long time, we thought this was the reason they came to us is that the main reason, and you can see 48% of the services uh, mentioned that they came to us, one, because the training is respectful and pleasant and being in the training unit provides them uh, a, a practical training in fashion and styling and design. And this is their passion. This is what they want to do. And they did not come to the Ndesha because of the similarity and the characteristics to their colleague and fellow uh, service users. Um, the final, uh, I think, and probably most interesting uh, um, finding was the fact that we saw when we asked service users what are their expectations from their vocation engagement uh, training in the Shah, we received, as you can see, lots of reasons, but we also saw new expectations that we didn't see in other evaluation processes we conducted in other vocational engagement enterprises. And this is specific to the Shah. Service users in the Ndesha, one, need more support, specifically more emotional support. And in addition, since most of the service users, as we saw in the former slides, came from, uh, a, a, came with previous, a very vast a previous experience in, from the open labor market, they have very high expectations from the training, the professional training they receive in the units. And they are very focused on being included once back in the open labor market. These are women who were once uh, a salesperson, a manager, an engineer in the open labor market, had a crisis and wanted to go back to what they were before the crisis. So they're very focused, they know what they want. And we understood that we need to provide them much better, uh, much uh, more uh, emotional support, much more focused uh, training on uh, being included and very much faster and higher uh, and better um, and uh, more adjusted content of specifically maybe uh, relevant to fashion or maybe customer services or other fields they would like to be included in. So this is just a glimpse of the findings of this evaluation process. And I would just say that this is one of 13 evaluation processes we did last year and this year we are already on 10 and this is only growing and we can see the need and demand come from the field from professional teams in the field that would like to conduct these evaluation processes since the findings helps them to better uh, uh, provide service with higher quality and much uh, uh, better adjustments that are very much needed. Thank you, Yael. I will go back to Hagar that will present a bit the uh, evaluation we do during the service. And I think she's going to give you a glimpse of a presentation we did to our employees. It's like a glimpse of an interior uh, presentation. Please, Hagar. Thank you, and thank you, Yael. So, so far, Yael has presented uh, how we measure things in the individual level of the service user, what is important to them, uh, what can enable them uh, to uh, promote themselves and to get uh, more. Uh, better support. And what I'm going to present now is the tool that we developed to measure our units, the service, the, the quality of the service that we give. And this uh, particular tool is designed to measure our training units. Um, we want to make sure that in each unit, we have a meaningful vocational engagement process. Um, the MVP, the Meaningful Vocational Practice, has four components. In each component, we have a series of yes or no questions. 
that both staff members and, and service users fill out separately. And the, 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 the scores combine to an overall score of the unit. And we measure this every three months uh, in each unit. And we present the results to all of our uh, organization and the best units are very celebrated. And we so let's quickly uh, look into every component. The first is the diversity or the main question in the, the, with the diversity or variety is to ask, are there enough significant roles in various levels of complexity for the service users to perform and learn, and learn from? Uh, to measure that, we create an observation between a task and a role. A task is an action to perform, right? And a role is a set of uh, behaviors uh, with an agreed social function that has an accepted code of norms. Um, what we do is dis we disseminate roles into tasks and we craft tasks into, uh, into roles. Great. So we can see if everyone is included in the overall process. Uh, I'll give you an example like the role of cooking or a cook in one of our um, cafes include, what does it include? What are the tasks? Can a person that cannot be a cook yet can perform several tasks and then become a cook? So we work both top down and bottom up uh, according to this. And we measure does the unit um, have that component uh, of having significant rules when our goal you move the slide? Yeah. Our goal is to uh, have more people in more roles. And to do that, we need to create room for error. We need to allow plenty of room for people to make mistakes, to, uh, to be very uh, flexible about the tasks that they do. Uh, and all that while running the operation, the business. So it's a very tricky component. And we uh, uh, take high um, significance of measuring it. The second component is the continuity. Does the unit maintain a continuous flow of work for all service users? Um, in other words, is it a real business? Does it simulate a real business? Does it look like a real business? Does it have the workflow of a real business? Because a real business would close if it's empty most of the time. And for us, it's the same thing. It's not, uh, if it's not a real business, then it's not providing the best service uh, to train from. Um, we use this, uh, this component to measure, uh, to measure and to um, make changes if we see that it's low. For example, yeah, you can move on. <laughs> For example, uh, good coffee. Um, we had a one good coffee unit that we understood does not have uh, enough continuity because we saw it on the on the score, and we re we went deep into it and we realized that the location was not good enough and it was not creating enough flow of customers. Uh, it was a very tough decision financially, but be because of uh, our findings, we decided to move it to a different location, and we saw in the next three months of operating, we saw that that score is starting to get higher. Um, Another thing we did in Good Coffee, as we saw that in the early morning hours, there is not enough customers yet in, in many of our locations, in many of our units. So we created um, the, the hospitality trays, the, the catering trays, so that people can have something to do and real work, meaningful work to do, even when there are not uh, existing or clients that are in the unit. And we really saw that that affected the scores in the measurement and people were more satisfied with what they have to do. The third component is the relevancy. Relevancy relates to the open labor markets. Does the activity in the unit teaches real skills? and real roles that are relevant to the open labor market, we tend to forget that sometimes because the unit is so nice and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and sometimes it work, works really well, but is it relevant to the real
still open the market people using the 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 right uh, um, utilities and facilities um is there real commercial value to what we're producing or the service that we offer um are the service users aware of that uh, are they familiar with the existing options in the labor market and do they recognize the value that they bring which brings me to the fourth component now the identity and meaning and for me that is one of the most important components of all because we all want to feel meaningful uh, in our work and we, we all have uh, a, an identity of what we do that reflects on how we see ourselves as people and this component really um, checks does the unit or the brand if there's a chain of uh, the coffee shops or uh, or a chain of the, of the bookstores does the brand has a clear and positive identity not just to the person but also in the community uh, can the service user define his role? Does he, the, do they know what they're doing? Can they sit in the family dinner and say, oh, I am a cook at Good Coffee, which is an excellent uh, brand uh, and a very good quality of food and, and drinks? Can they say that? Can they feel that? So that is uh, really, uh, I think, important. Um, and that's why we really emphasize um, and, and um, put hard work into the brand itself. Uh, just leave it for one more second. Um, is the occupational identity meaningful to both people and community? If I am if I'm, uh, at the secondhand book shop, I am not only helping myself, I'm also helping the environment. Uh, or in, in Dandasha clothing, I'm helping the envir environment, I'm, I'm helping to recycle, uh, I'm making people happy with the good coffee I serve them, so that the, the brand identity is very important. So, how does it work? As I said, we measure it every three months. Uh, the questionnaire is being delivered to staff and manager, service users and staff members are filling it and they assess the four criteria. Um, each receives a score uh, and um, we get the score for each unit and for each brand in all four criteria. Uh, you can see in the slide here, the, the, the results of each vocational engagement enterprise. You got the Shah, Tanks, which is the selling booth, Good Coffee, Good Dog, which is a dog walking company, Rebooks and Books and our production uh, brands uh, that makes chocolate and candles. And we really can see in each uh, component, what is the score? Are there differences between what the staff think and what the service users think? Sometimes there are, and that always uh, creates uh, a deeper um, evaluation of the unit to, to understand why the results are the way they are and what is the meaning of it. Um, I can give you another example of what we do with that result because results uh, are, are meaningless if you don't act on them, if, if you don't uh, create a uh, change when you see something is not working. So I can uh, give you an example. In one of our, we have production uh, production plant that used to make um, candles and paper materials and the grade was low for a long time and in all measurements, in all components. Uh, especially in the in the identity and meaning and in the quality of the work. Um, so we we said and we thought together with the service user, what are we going to do about it? We tried different things and we tried to improve things, but it did not work at all. And we had to come to the conclusion that we need to switch the whole brand. The whole unit needs to get a new brand and you get new kind of uh, activity. Uh, so we decided to open open a website for the Dandasha uh, brand and that sell products parallel to the ones sold in the shops. So they what they, they started to do in the unit is um, they started to operate this website and that gave them a lot of meaning and identity and continuity and everything else in the components. Uh, because it completely changed their whole perception of what they're doing and what they actually did. Uh, so 
they you can see here when they learn how to take they take a picture of the clothes and they they upload it to the website which also uh, created a lot of digital skills that allow people we could see more and more people uh, in the open label market in digital roles and high level jobs uh, than, than they were before because they got better training. Um, this is the Dundasha website. It is in Hebrew, but Google Translate really translates it very well. So you can uh, look into it afterwards if you want. Uh, and that's a good, I think that's a good example of the impact that the measuring tool uh, has in, in really pushing us to make better decisions and better our service uh, for the benefit of our service users and uh, from their requests and what the, they show us and what they uh, are asking us uh, to do. So I will finish here. Thank you. And thank you so yeah, thank you so much, Agar, for this. Uh, we're going to switch now to Tal. Uh, Tal is Director of Support Employment in Shekulotov, and he is in team are in charge of convincing and bringing our uh, service users into meaningful jobs in the open level market. Um, he oversees the ongoing relations with over 500 employers <clears throat> at the national and local levels. With his team, Tal developed the P3 support employment model and supervised its implementation across the unit's 148 units. Um, he has trained teams in Germany, China, Holland, and France, holds an MA in social work and licensed clinical supervision by the Israeli Recovery and Rehabilitation School. As a part of the school staff, he lectures on support and employment and CSW intervention to recovery specialists and job coaches. Tal, enjoy. Thank you, Ophir. Um, just so I know the, the time, Ophir, it's like maximum 10 minutes, right? Maximum 10 minutes. Maximum 10 minutes, okay. So, uh, so hi, I'm, I'm Tal, Support Employment uh, Director, and um, my department consists of around uh, 85 uh, supported employment specialists or job coaches all around Israel. Um, and our main uh, challenge and, and um, target is to help more and more people uh, move from our training units and shops to the um, to the open labor market. Before the, the placement, the main focus of the job coaches is naturally on things like increasing motivation, self self confidence, uh, defining realistic uh, goals together, and, and of course going out there for the job search, uh, approaching employers together, etc. After the placement, um, the service user continues to get support from the same job coach he knows from before from the training center but naturally the the focus changes they the the, the support is more on things like um, helping to uh, learn the job keep the job uh, and develop their careers now the post placement uh, data is very important for us and i'll give you uh, three there are many reasons i'll give you three main reasons um, for this so one thing by checking and, and analyzing uh, the data of the, po the post placement data, we can clearly see the correlation between the training and the work in the labor market. Or, in other words, uh, we can better see which training, which specific training uh, chain is more um, and more efficient. And, and I'll give you for this two opposite examples. One example is on the one hand, a good coffee, which was uh, mentioned uh, mentioned before. Um, we see that from our data that the service users from Good Coffee manage to find and retain, keep jobs in similar kinds of, of um, uh, jobs, like uh, restaurants and coffee shops, etc. So we know for a fact that the training is very efficient and very similar to the open labor market. Therefore, we put more emphasis on creating relationships with employers from this field. On the other hand, Thanks. We, it's another um, uh, rehabilit vocational enterprise um, that uh, operates selling stalls in shopping malls and shopping centers all around Israel. And we see from our data that service users, we saw that service users from uh, tanks um, uh, trying to uh, integrate in similar jobs in the open labor market, the number of success was low. And employers in this field of, of sales were not so satisfied from their performance. Um, 
things so we heard that they were not uh, used enough to um, uh, to handle pressure at work or to do multitasking while operating a shift. Okay, so for this information, we understood that the training center needs uh, some changes. Um, and therefore, we made changes in the last two years. For example, we reduced uh, the amount of the general amount of stalls um, and focused more on stalls in only in very central places in the shopping center to have more traffic. And we also gave more responsibility to uh, to the service users in the shift, so they would be more ready for the multitasking in the real open labor market. And we are start, starting gradually to see more service users integrate in the, this field. We still want more, of course, but that, that's why the data is so important. Um, you can move to the next one. Yeah, the uh, second main reason that I'll mention out of three uh, of the importance of the post-placement data, data as, as we called it, is the uh, relationships with uh, employers. We work with 500 employers all around Israel. Some connections are, are like, you know, very focused. Some relationships are, are big with big chains all around Israel. Uh, and um, the, uh, by analyzing uh, the, the data after the placement, it's, we can improve the relationships we have with employers. I'll give you one example. And I have, um, a continuous uh, um, connection with the uh, head of HR of Hoodies. Hoodies is uh, one of the, or maybe the largest retail um, company in Israel. They ha actually, it's like a group. They have all kinds of fashion chains under them. We currently have um, above 30 um, workers there. So when I talk with her, I can give her immediate answer also about uh, specific workers in, in, in specific branches, but also more macro answers. For example, uh, she's, in, she's in charge of many kinds of chains, so I can tell her which chain has, has been more successful in the last six months in retaining uh, employees uh, sent by us. Um, or uh, what, what kind of background do the workers we have in her different branches have? Where did we have more success? Uh, and less. And this gives us a lot of cred credibility while dealing with employers. And um, we also have a job fair. This is actually a picture from last week. We had a very big job fair in, in the north of Israel with 40 employers. We do this very big job fairs a few times a year, and we analyze the data after each job fair. And it helps us, of course, plan the next one and to be more efficient to help more people find jobs. Can we move to the next one? Yeah, so the third reason um, and last reason I wanted to mention for the importance of the post uh, placement data is that we don't see ourselves uh, as um, only a placement service. Okay, we want to help people not only find a job and not only keep the job, but also develop uh, their careers. Uh, improving the salary is important, the job scope is important, how many days people work, how many hours. Uh, the retention, of course, the promotion. Uh, promotion can mean move to different positions in the same workplace or to another workplace. So all, all of these things, we can only see them when we uh, support so many people. We can only see them when we analyze the, the, the post-placement uh, data and see what has to be improved and therefore also develop um, professional solutions and supports uh, also for the for this uh, stage of the, of the support. Um, so these are these are the main things. Um, and I'll give it back to you now, uh, Ophir, to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Um, I have another three or four minutes to show you some some issues. But uh, those of you who wanted to start filling the chat uh, in questions are welcome uh, uh, to do it soon. Uh, in the Q A, yeah, in the Q and A option, I saw Dimitri is saying uh, in the Q and A option, you can also feel free to ask very direct questions. Ask Israelis are direct people, so feel free to ask whatever you want. Uh, we will be happy um, to answer that. So I just want to show you a bit how does it look and how do we use this data. I'm going to show you a true result uh, of of uh, the previous quarter. Um, this quarter, the second quarter of Q3 of, of uh, uh, the Q2 of 2023 is updated 
here from yesterday. Uh, we presented it to our team this week. So we wanted to have this dashboard that will allow us to celebrate success, as Agar mentioned, but also to know where we want our, our plot flashlights to look into. Um, so we have three main uh, indexes. The satisfaction index, uh, what you need and how do you feel, that's on the left, being, again, uh, being uh, delivered by the service improvers to allow more uh, direct answers. We have the meaningful vocational practice, MVP, and we have the placement, how much did each unit placed. Um, the pre uh, indexes that uh, Yael has presented and the post that Thales presented, those are results that, uh, that, are, that are more analyzed in depth with our management and with the relevant uh, teams. These are the things that we share with all of our staff and stakeholders. So this is the general um, situation of the organization. And then we have the outstanding units in each and every Uh, measurement in order to the success. Uh, so we can see that in satisfaction index, the Sharon unit in tanks was very high. Um, and then we have the same pair uh, vocational engagement enterprises. So in rebooks, these are the results across all of the units of rebooks uh, in Israel in the different, uh, in a different measurement. Same goes for Danda Shah. These are the, the um, idea of what's going on in each and every unit that allows uh, the team to be focused on the why <laughs> uh, and allows us as a, as a management uh, as well uh, to do that. Um, I would say, and, and welcome you afterwards, we, we have uh, many different international partnerships. We like to share what we do. So if any one of you uh, at the end of today uh, we'd like to reach out to us uh, to see how this thing can be implemented uh, with, of course, with the right changes locally. We can also say that Israel is a very diverse society. I'm sure you can see it sometimes on the news. Uh, it means that our units also look differently from within Israel. We do have units that is designed more to the Arabic speaking community, others to the more secular liberal Tel Aviv, others in more ultra Orthodox Jerusalem. So the need to culturally adapt the units and also sometimes the measurement is something that, uh, that we are used to. So um, I would really encourage uh, questions. I know some of them, are, I don't know if some of them are on the chat, uh, but please do it uh, in the Q and A. You can see people from Austria and Bulgaria and Greece. Hi, Katy. And on the, and the other, ah, I'm based in Portugal. Hi, Teresa. Uh, you can see that Teresa here is from Portugal as well. On the, um, any questions? Because if not, I'll have to um, ask my colleagues tough questions myself. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. I will ask that question and I swear we didn't plan it before, but uh, do feel, do feel it, uh, uh, do feel free to ask how does the Q&A work? Because uh, uh, only host and panelists can, Dimitri, can they just like click the Q&A and, and, and have into it? So feel free to have it either in the Q&A or in the chat. I see it all. I'll ask Tal, um, Tal, I mean, I know that many organizations outside and also within Israel and outside of Israel has issues in regarding to uh, privacy, uh, privacy issues. And it seems that your department and your way of measuring the issues is really after people are already in the open labor market, they have their own independent contract with their own data. How do you actually get to this data? And what about, what about kind of privacy issues of this data? You know, those are people's salaries. Uh, those are people kind of, yeah. so how do you deal with that? Of course, you're right. It's an, it's, it's always an issue in, in supported employment. Um, generally, um, I have to say that the vast majority of our service users uh, approaching uh, employees in the labor market want 
this process to be together with uh, with a job coach. So the job coach is a, is a full part of um, first of all approaching the employer, um, going together with the service user to the job interview, and uh, we see that the, in the in the first month or two of while starting to work, um, the um, um, the um, the intensive support of the job coach while the service user is learning the job and getting to, to know it is very important. So most of the service users want the job coaches very close to them at this specific period. And also, as any, everybody knows, one of the crucial elements of IPS, of uh, the IPS supported employment uh, model, is that the job coaches help the service users uh, secure their rights. So they go together with them, with uh, the negotiations with an employer about about the salary and about all, all kinds of other uh, work and uh, worker rights. So at the vast majority of cases, the job coaches are part of this process and th therefore there is no problem. They know all this all, all this data about the salary and about the job scope and et cetera. It's true that there is a minority of cases that the, the uh, service user wants the job coach more to be behind and, uh, and the service user himself does all the uh, the process uh, approaching the, the employer and etc and in these cases it's it's um the uh, the service user has the autonomy to, to say what he wants and doesn't want to say so um so for the vast majority of cases we have uh, the information there is a small minority of, of uh, people that uh, don't want to share uh, their uh, specific uh, information uh, about their rights at the, at the workplace and etc. Uh, but we we have enough data for, for above ninety percent of the workers to have uh, a clear a clear understanding of what's going on. I hope I answered that. I think so. Yeah. Still, um, feel uh, feel free to have more questions. Also, in your own mother language, mother tongue, I try to. Translate that in Google Translate. I understand sometimes writing can be a challenge, so feel free to write in your mother tongue as well. Um, maybe I'll ask uh, Yael or Agar, um, planning ahead the, um, planning ahead the HR and the career development issues. Uh, I know that we discussed uh, as well. How can we really help our service users in the career development? What kind of measurement? exists already in the pure HR world in order to assess such uh, such career development service and such career development, uh, you know, measurement. So if you have anything uh, to say about it, I know that we don't have the solutions yet. We're still looking on that on that issues, but maybe we can share with our colleagues here what are we looking at and what are, what are our questions on that matter as well, because it's, uh, we don't have solutions yet, but we, we want to be there. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is really the our next challenge. This is the challenge that we are dealing with now, uh, because I think we developed the, these tools to measure what we are doing now and measure the, the quality of our training. And when it comes to career development, it is a more, um, I think, common thing that everyone does. Not everyone goes through training, but we all have some sort of careers and career uh, development or planning. So as you said, what we decided to do is to um, analyze existing tools and to see which tool will be the best one uh, from the HR world, uh, which tool will be the best one to use uh, for our service users. So what we're doing now is actually um, research of existing tools, and we are going to check them with service users using them and uh, staff members, and we'll see which one will give us the most accurate results. So if any of you, uh, listeners that I cannot see, have any suggestions of tools that you are using to assess career development um, from the HR world? How, how am I planning my career? How do I measure that I am doing or taking the right steps, that I am, am I happy from where I stand from where I'm right now and where I want to be and assess where I want to be? We would love to, um, to hear about 
on that note, maybe the last thing that I would say, maybe that to yeah, we also have experience in taking existing tools. We have worked with the um, European Commission on the G Digital Profici Proficiency Questionnaire. That was a tool that they have developed to assess the digital proficiency of companies, and we have adapted that. Uh, maybe, El, can you elaborate a little bit about your work there? We adapted that to people with disabilities, um, also work through the SVD working scaling this uh, to uh, it was also been implemented in in uh, in Spain and Germany so please yeah, if you can say this how do you adapt yes. this tool yeah? so this is a really good example of taking an existing tool and adjusting it just like Agar said that in, in the, we are in the process of uh, exploring a, a career development tools so we so we just saw and used um, the European Commission um, um, a, frame, a general framework for a digital proficiency for the general population. It was a it was a tool that was combined of four different sections, very big ones. Uh, two of them objective reports, two of them subjective reports, and then we used the theoretical background of this uh, evaluation process, and we just uh, synthesized it into ten simple questions that the service user can answer. And in the end, uh, he can receive an evaluation of, of his digital proficiency level. Um, the digital, the theoretical framework uh, helped us understand which domains of knowledge and abilities we needed to address in order to assess digital proficiency. And we did use their experience and expertise in this field and just adjusted it to the needs and abilities of people with disabilities. And today we are, um, after mapping more than 3,000 service users in Shekulotov, um, we found that after the mapping process, we actually saw that most service users are in the, the, the classification process classifies service users at digital proficiency level to three levels, the beginner, intermediate, and advanced. The results showed us that most of the service users are at the beginner level. We know that all of us have digital gaps. We know that the corona faced us with many not so simple uh, situations uh, using digital platforms. And for our service users, we know that in, from the beginning, they had a bigger gap to um, face. And this showed us that uh, indeed, a lot of uh, service users are in the beginner level. And then uh, we had a really few in the intermediate. And then we had a lot also around the same size of uh, service users in the uh, uh, advanced level as in the beginner level. And then we saw that it was, it differentiated between the different social enterprises and the uh, training uh, units. And each domain has its characteristics of service users. And this is why it's important to understand the background and not just seeing the segment of the um, evaluation, but also consider the background of service users that are in the specific uh, uh, enterprise. And we also saw differences in age groups in, in uh, services from the Arab and the Jew society. We saw that there are bigger gaps that needed to be addressed in the Arab society. And then we uh, started adjusting all the training program uh, also to, and to have it culturally adjusted, adjusted and also to the needs of the uh, Arab society because they use different platforms in some cases and some of them are not in use, uh, they, do, they do not use some of them. So we adjusted it to the needs of uh, this specific population. And we are now after adjusting the two uh, to five different languages. I think now it's Spain, Germany, English, Russian, Hebrew, and Arabic. So six languages today. And also to different populations, people with psychosocial disabilities, but not only other types of disabilities. And we're continuing to grow and to adjust it to further and new uh, uh, types of disabilities. Thank you, Yael. I just uh, answer Nari. Um, we said that uh, when we're talking about people, Nari asked if when you're talking about people with disabilities, could you please define age range kind of disability? Um, so we are working with the different Israeli ministries, mainly with the Ministry of Health, but also with the Ministry of Social Affairs, ministry that uh, deals with all the other disabilities, not only psychosocials, but autism, um, people with intellectual disabilities. Um, we work with the Ministry of Defense about severe cases of PTSD. So we, 
most of our people are people with complex disabilities, usually 40% disabilities and up, who are entitled into the Israeli government rehabilitation packages. So if I can do the similarities to countries we know as around Europe, those are the people who usually have been diverted into traditional sheltered employment services. We are still regulated under sheltered employment services. Um, people who uh, who don't believe, and also they need to say about themselves, I'm not ready for the open market yet. They, they want to be in this process. Um, just that uh, we kind of transfer the traditional sheltered employment services into, into person-oriented services. And after discussing like, with our government, allowed different services to be given from the same unit. So if someone is working in a, a bookshop that used to be a sheltered workshop, he's receiving all of the services that was mentioned today there in the same shop, even when he's already in the open labor market with a full job, he will receive the support employment services from the same supported employment specialist in the shop, allowing transition and kind of a safe place. The unit is the home base, uh, which gives the confidence for the people to jump into the open labor market and still maintain their social and vocational support that they are used to have. Um, okay. Thank you, Dionysis. Um, yeah, I think that's about adapting it locally uh, to your own organization. I think that this is something that we are also interested, how this kind of, uh, how our indexes can be, can be um, presented locally. The DPQ, for example, we set together with experts in Germany and Spain, uh, culturally adapted the questions, how they are presented. In the case of intellectual disabilities, we added a lot of visual uh, issues to the questionnaires. Today we work with uh, a company from uh, from India actually uh, to have this kind of uh, technical ability. So to, to have the DPQ for instance, all online to allow also other organizations to use it. So thank you, Dion Dionysis. Um, oh, Ophir, can I just come in as, with a question for you sure yeah uh, well more or less i think you already replied it but my uh, my main question would have been uh what your app could be also a, a good idea for uh, not only for persons to place in the open labor market but also for instance in italy you know that we have the cooperatives or something like that it's more than a sheltered but sometimes it happens that persons with disabilities are a bit shy to go to work in in open labor market and of course they wanted to be supported as well so i think that your app could be useful for them as well uh monitoring uh how they can work and how if they are satisfied uh, on their job also if it's sheltered or like uh, our cooperatives that was a bit uh, what I wanted to point out and hear from no, I, you. Thank you. No, I, I agree. I know that we have a lot of discussions within our working group at the Employment Working Group. What is meaningful work in, in sheltered environment, in cooperative environment? And I think this is also what we wanted to ask us, right? Because, yes, we are focusing on the fact that, you know, we, we, we increased transition rate from 1% to 36%, but still the vast majority of the people staying with us and we want them to have a meaningful journey we want them to be respected we wanted us to focus on how can we improve the services for them and we wanted to have a, a strong identity as Agar said and go back we have the saying uh, what is your shabbat dinner story you know in israel we have uh, usually every friday night we have a shabbat dinner and we wanted to give them a story to tell the family, how was your week? I, I was working in a cafe and someone came out and you wouldn't believe it didn't have the change. Oh, I was working in Vantage. We want to give them a meaningful uh, reason to wake up in the morning and uh, to be in constant interaction with the society. So yes, the, even though our focus is in the, in the, the open labor market and that's our goal, the MVP, uh, I think can allow a lot of different types of uh, uh, sheltered vocational training on the spectrum that we all have in the ESPD. 
to measure their ongoing uh, services, to show it to stakeholders, family, uh, government, but mainly to themselves and ask themselves, the team, the service users, how can we make what we do meaningful? Not everyone is ready to the open level market. We just don't know who um, and our ability is to give the pathway to everyone and to improve the ongoing, uh, the ongoing training and, and life to those who, who aren't. I agree to your comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree totally with what you are saying. And I go back to what I said at the beginning, the decent work, um, whatever, it, wherever it comes, the idea of working, but it has to be a, a correct way of, uh, of work. Sometimes it's open, sometimes, and as you said, the majority is still sheltered. So, of course, we have to uh, we have to look at them as well, and not because, but just for the reasons we were saying before, uh, yeah. the satisfaction they can they can have it also uh, with that and with the minimum wage. That's what we are trying to run sometimes. Uh, to help persons with disabilities, severe as well, to be satisfied of what they are doing of their daily life. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll, I want to answer uh, Antonia who asked uh, the cost. So I, I just want to clarify, I also put you the link there, the application that we are now, right now, um, uh, 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 building is the one who is relevant to the, not to the MVP, I'm sorry, to the um, DPQ, uh, to the digital proficiency in order to help, uh, to help uh, different organizations to uh, assess the digital proficiency of their service users. This is the something that we want to um, adapt, make available, I put it in the chat, available to different organizations to use in order to define the digital pr proficiency of their service users. The rest at this stage is welcome to adaptation by us, uh, tailor made to other organizations. We, uh, the reason that we, not, right now we are working on application for the DPQ for the digital proficiency is that we've already tried and piloted this in Spain and Germany that gave us the, the, the tools and the confidence and the, and the knowledge to make it into something more digital. Um, so I think that we invite you those of you who think that the indexes uh, are relevant for some sort of piloting, uh, so we will also uh, be happy to discuss it and think how we can help you assess it. And maybe one day it also becomes something, uh, an online tool uh, that we can all use.